Uh, Mike today will be speaking with us on leading, managing, and succeeding remotely. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Mike Murray. Mike, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm uh, I'm incredibly excited to be here today. It's always fun to get to uh, to talk about new things. And uh, you know, I haven't done most of this material before because there hasn't really been a reason to. Even though many of us have worked remotely before, the obviously the changes of the last uh, six months have have created a new opportunity for us all to um, to be in a remote situation at work. And I know that part of this is that we're all tired, you know, and and I think that one of the things that is pushing everyone right now is the additional stress that comes from the time that we're in. And so, you, you know, everything that we've done to be moving remote has been done not in the kind of context that we may have originally wanted to be remote. You know, in the old days, the old days being like a year ago, um, remote in, remote work was a was an exciting thing, was a thing that was a, an opportunity for people. Now we're all forced to be remote, and we're living in this place where the additional stress that comes from the world at large is challenging. So the world that we live in now is not the kind of remote work that maybe we are used to. Um, you know, at least Google Images thinks that if you look up security and hackers that uh, that we're pretty good at remote things and, you know, being in the basement by ourselves. And that's true in a lot of ways. You know, we've always had the opportunity to be more effective remotely than, say, uh, you know, somebody who is on the front lines, you know, at a, at, at a grocery store or in retail or at a restaurant. And so we've always had some advantages, but the remote that we've had to this point is very different than the remote that we have now. And I think that we don't talk enough about this. If you Google remote work, you're going to get a lot of uh, really trite advice that that worked out really well in the old days, you know, and, and we're, we're, we're all in organizations that have had some amount of remote people always. If you think about global sales organizations, almost always you have salespeople that live in regions that don't have offices. You have support that's been outsourced or offshored to places that aren't the same as your, you know, traditional headquarters. We've always had tech people that were remote in some ways, but we used to have all of these features that even if you were a remote employee, usually during your interview process, at some point you flew somewhere or or went somewhere to sit in a room with the people that were interviewing you. You had uh, onboardings quite often on site with Scope, for example, and on our early employees, regardless of where they started, all of them flew to New York for the first few days of their employment where they sat in a room with me and the rest of the team. And, and we built the culture that would sustain remotely in person. Um, similarly, I, I've never been in an organization that didn't have at least once a year some sort of pull everybody together kind of meeting. Um, whether that's team-based or organization-based, we always did in-person things, even for the remote uh, employees. And that's different now, you know, with, with a lot of our companies saying that offices are going to be closed until sometime in 2021. Um, we're, we're not in the same kind of world of remote that we used to be. And that's causing a lot of challenges. And, and I don't think enough of us are really thinking about what that means because we're missing so much of what enabled us to build good culture. First off, and I'll talk about this a lot because I think it's a, one of the big limiters, video conferencing in this sort of world creates a kind of mental and cognitive fatigue that sitting in a room face to face don't doesn't even as as the biggest introvert in the world um which i i often am and i'm i'm drained by face to face interaction i'm doubly drained by face to face interaction over zoom and so whereas i could sit in a room with someone for 8 hours and have a conversation by about 90 minutes on zoom i'm ready to go have a nap um, similarly, it's really hard to form social bonds over 
over video conference and in the world that we have. If you don't already have a social bond with someone, if you haven't met them before and you don't have shared history, it's hard to imagine making a friendship from scratch over Zoom. And those social bonds are things that are really important in the workplace. And we all decry politics a lot, but lots of things get done because people can agree on where they're going and they can forge a shared future together. Similarly, we lose a lot of the informal structures of information sharing and information gathering that it's it, that it happen at most companies. You know, the the colloquial version of calling them hallway conversations. You don't have a hallway. You don't have hallway conversations. You don't have those those impromptu sort of interactions that really drive a lot of organizations and where they're going. Um, and similarly. Without that face-to-face -face interaction, you just don't get as rich a set of information. I mean, if I'm if you're only looking at me from here up, which you all are, um, and I not only that, I have a microphone in my face. It it's a different level of information you get than even if I'm standing on a stage in front of you. You can't really see all of my body language, and you can't see the things that allow me to be an effective influencer and allow you to know if your influence is working on me. So we're in a situation where a lot of these challenges are lining up and we haven't restructured our organizations to figure out how to deal with them. And so what I wanna talk about today are really three phases of how you create culture and your, your sort of touch points about how you create teams and what this new world is doing to the, each of those phases and how we deal with them. And, and obviously the first place to start is interviewing. You know, before you even get to the company, your interaction with that organization and the people in it often shape your your opinions on a whether you want the job and b whether they want you to have the job. But also, the the impressions you get of the people in the interview process become things that you build upon later on as you become an employee. And in the world that we have, we now have challenges with that. And so, what you know, one of the very beginning things in the interview process is candidate experience. If you talk to HR people or recruiters, they'll talk a ton about candidate experience. And in my experience, most organizations don't do candidate experience particularly well. But in this world, it's even worse because in a lot of cases, and I've certainly seen this in my past and, and certainly been able to, to deal with this at different organizations, even if you have an HR department and a recruiting team that doesn't do a good job of running the interview process effectively, you can usually, as a, as a hiring manager or as a member of the team that's doing the interviewing, overcome that, that challenge just by the personal relationship you create with the candidate. You know, I've, I've certainly had lots of opportunities where, and, and lots of experiences on the other side, where the process runs terribly, they don't seem to have their act together, but I have such a strong bond with the person who is interviewing me and the people who I'm meeting that I'm not as worried about the challenges with the structure. Now, here's the problem. In this world where everything is basically me staring at a video camera like I'm talking now, my ability to create that interpersonal bond to overcome the challenges of my interview process is really limited. And so this is a time where as a hiring manager, and by the way, you should be looking for everything I'm talking about today, you should be looking for these things as a candidate. They will tell you a lot about the organization that you're, you're interviewing to join. Um, as a hiring manager, my ability to overcome the challenges of my interview process is incredibly limited. And so now I have to start being more rigorous. Um, and, and it's really funny that I'm sitting here saying this as a uh, as the founder of a what's currently a seven or eight person startup, um, because we are rigor in an interview process for a tiny company is not exactly something that's easy. And, and we struggle with this. I'm struggling with this personally. Even as I was writing this slide, I was struggling because I know that this is hard, but I also know that this is my only option. If I cannot convince the candidate that the company is great just because we have a great relationship and that will overcome it, then we have to re replace that trust by being more rigorous. And so 
that's both a question of you know your HR team and your recruiting team, but also just how the candidate is experienced by the team. And you know, do we show up on time for interviews? Do we seem to have um, ourselves organized? Do we know what questions we want to ask? You know, these are all things that create an impression of the company and of you as a leader and and as a team lead. Um, if you have those things together, the candidate will will believe in you. And if you don't, you can't just rely on your ability to create a relationship anymore because unfortunately that's really limited over Zoom. And so we have to really change the format, um, not just to be rigorous in terms of the, the way that the process runs, but realizing that a lot of our interview processes are completely outdated and just don't live in this format. You know, uh, most or many companies that I've interviewed with love to do the let's put eight back to back or 10 back to back interviews in, in a single day. You know, the candidate sits in a room and every 30 minutes somebody new comes in. And if you're keeping that same sort of interview style over Zoom by by about hour six, I think the candidate is going to be so so mentally exhausted that they're going to be barely able to form a sentence. And at least I would be. And so. The idea of doing things the way we were doing them six months ago, it just can't work. Or you're just going to you're just going to by the end of that day, the the people who are interviewing that candidate are just going to be like, why are we talking to this person? You know, it doesn't it doesn't allow the candidate to show themselves. It doesn't allow the candidate to get a good sense of the company. There's so many things you can't do with that. So now we have to break up the interviews over many days. One of the things that I've noticed is our interviews are nowhere near as effective as they used to be. So, you know, if I could get, if I knew in an hour, I could get a certain set of information in a, in an in-person interview. Now that takes 90 minutes. So, and, and even better, it's, it would be far better if I did um, two 45 minute interviews than a one 90 minute interview in terms of that. So we've added steps to the process. We've also started breaking up the process and, uh, and inserting days. Um, we're also exploring the idea of how do we bring in multiple media to replicate the, the person's experience of the job with us. So we're, we're trying to figure out how to do interviews over Slack, for example, because you know I don't know about all of you, but I spend a lot of time slacking my team today and, and living in Slack and email and co-written documents um, where we might have just been like, you know, hey, let's go to that whiteboard over there. Let's go, let's go sit in that room and work on this problem. Now we're slacking each other. And so can you replicate that in the interview to see how that candidate is going to interact with you? And I know that there's all kinds of ableist concerns around this and I'm that's a whole other talk, but but realizing that um, we are, if the candidate is going to live in a particular world, right? We're gonna live on Zoom, we're gonna live in Slack, we're gonna live in Google Docs, uh, or Office 365 or whatever your particular platforms are, um, how do we make the interview format um, replicate that so we can see what the real uh, experience of both sides will be? Um, and and so, you know, the real challenge from where I sit is most of my interviews have involved whiteboards over the years. You know, I, I think the best way to get a sense of candidates, especially when you're so, when you're checking tech skills and things like that is, let's solve a problem together, let's do something collaborative. And almost always it involves a whiteboard. And I don't, uh, you know, go to webinar and Zoom are interesting platforms, but co-whiteboarding on Zoom is still not, uh, not at all the same and not something I do on a daily basis. So what we've realized is we have to figure out how to take that whiteboarding problem solving uh, set up and move that into a in, into a bit of a new world. So, um, and especially to do so in a way that's somewhat rigorous, right? You you want each candidate to be able to have a very similar experience and for you to be able to assess them side by side. So we've started adding in a bunch of stuff. We've started adding in um, actual written assessments and online tests, or uh, and in some cases it's literally just some questions that we throw into LinkedIn before the candidate applies for the job. Um, similarly, we've started adding in real-time collaboration stuff, at least for for code and for architecture. You know, we can um, 
we can do you know a shared lucid chart doc and we can both add things to uh to a uh an architecture doc or we can share that and we can both be looking at it and have that conversation um design you know co-designing in things in uh, products like figma for wireframes and ux um shared product specs things like that um and also there's a bunch of services that have popped up to do you know uh, online pair programming, which I think are, is a particularly interesting one when we're hiring coders. Um, also, we've really doubled down on on auditions and homework. Um, and I think that that traditionally we did a lot of homework. We, you know, at various places that I've been, we've always had a an assignment, especially if we're hiring technical people. Here, reverse engineer this app and tell us, you know, why it's malicious or why it's not. That was something we did when I was at Lookout. And that was always great, but I think the more important thing now is, is not just the technical skill, because you would have the technical person do all this technical work, and then they come and you'd sit in front of you and you'd end up writing some stuff on the whiteboard. Now we've moved to a real audition type framework. And that audition at the end of the interview process takes is sort of a dual format. There's a take home work pro part of the process and also a presentation piece. And the presentation is usually done to all the relevant stakeholders in the company where where we start to ref, to go back and forth with what they're presenting so that it really it doesn't replicate the whiteboard experience but at least starts to and so we've been moving in this way and and an important thing to realize is the balance between work and presentation really depends on who you're hiring if you're hiring a salesperson I mean, the work might be here's here's our sales presentation. Come present it to us. You know, they're, they're not doing a ton of work. If you're hiring uh, a technical IC, a threat hunter, it's you know, go do here's a piece of malware. Tell us all about it. Or here's an actor. Tell us attribution and everything that there is to know about that actor. And most of that is the technical work, and the presentation is a small amount. Whereas the technical work is large, if you're talking about executives or salespeople or things like that, you you end up flipping that over, right? The presentation becomes a lot more important, or at least as important as the work given. So that's really a lot of the things that we've done, and that I've you know talked with a lot of friends who are doing some something similar around how to change the hiring process to really respect the world that we're living in. And I know I'm I'm putting a lot of information here. I'm hoping that this is pretty dense, but at the same time, um, these are all things that we all have to be thinking about if we're hiring, but also if you're being hired, you know, if if you're being pulled into an eight hour all day interview, um, that tells you something about the company and how they're thinking about hiring and experience and especially how potentially how the remote experience for the next, you know, six to nine months is likely to be when you're there. So, once the interview process is over, you have the job. And this starts to be an entirely new set of challenges, right? If you, every job pretty much I've ever been at, the onboarding process is you go to the office and on day one, you, you know, the CEO or somebody comes in and talks to you and they give you a laptop and IT helps you set it up and HR helps you set up finance and all of the benefits and all of that stuff. And you sit in that room for anywhere between the first day of your employment to the entire first week of your employment. And I, I don't, for me, those have never really been that productive anyway, but if someone wants me to sit on 40 hours of Zoom meetings to do onboarding, I think that that's probably the point at which um, my brain's going to explode. And I, I think we've we've lost the ability to do that. And so we have to change the format of onboarding. Onboarding, whereas it used to have a single format and be largely monolithic, now, the only way to be able to allow people to assimilate and, and absorb that level of information and that level of uh, content is to change the format. You have to think about how, you know, switching up media, switching up location, switching up length and audience and switching, you know, information density. So, um, you know, perhaps some of the the um onboarding can be delivered via video some of it 
some of it will have Zoom meetings, whether large group Zoom meetings or one-on-ones or small group interaction. Um, ideally, you are shifting more and more of your onboarding process to be documented and to be things that people can consume in an asynchronous way um, as they go. You know, I don't need someone necessarily to be on a group Zoom to explain to me uh, how to set up my email account and how to set up my uh, laptop now. There are lots of people who might need that, but again, that's a place where you could do on-demand one-on-ones and things of that nature. Um, the entire onboarding process probably needs to be rethought because most of us have done our onboardings in person over over the last 20 years. And with that, um, the inability to do that for the next nine months is going to mean that either people come on board and it's really painful and it takes them longer to really integrate with the organization. It takes them longer to know where information is. It takes them longer to know things, which means everything slows down or we're going to have to figure it out. And, uh, you know, one of the notes that I that I wanted to point out here is that things that we have assumed from prior onboardings may be different now. And I mentioned the way that I always did onboarding for scope is to fly everybody to New York and we would sit down and and. I would literally hand them a laptop. Well, now I have to make sure that laptop's delivered. Um, so if we're going to have that configured by one of our engineers, one of our IT people, um, that has to be sent to that person's house. They have to do it and they have to send it to the new employee's house. Or do I drop ship them that laptop from you know, Apple or whoever we're buying the laptop from? And then how do we figure out remote configuration? Simple logistics like send this person a laptop or send them a scope hoodie starts being a, a challenge that we've never had to think about before. And so the onboarding process really needs to be reimagined in a lot of ways because there are so many concerns. Now, that to me is the easy part of the onboarding process. The real onboarding process that is important from where I sit, and we'll talk a lot about this through the rest of the conversation because it's true, it's truly a big part of the culture, is the social side of onboarding. Every onboarding I've ever been to, um, at the coffee breaks, at the first lunch, um, you know, during the conversations, I get to know the people that I'm going to be working with, and especially the people that are starting on the same day. And we start to create social bonds at that time. Um, unfortunately, with Zoom, um, you know, the, the Zoom onboarding is me talking to the five people that have started that day. And when we all get up for, for a bio break or to fill our water glasses, nobody can talk to each other. Nobody talks to each other during those breaks. Nobody talks really at lunch in the same way because there's not really the, the ability to form those social bonds in that situation. And so, and, and by the way, that, that is the easy part. You know, a lot of the onboarding process involves uh, nightly dinners and happy hours with the executive team and, and things like that. These are all things that are about to go um, really sideways. And so how do we replace that? How do you replace the social integration of the onboarding process is something that I haven't seen a lot of people talk about or how they do it well. You know, the uh, the idea of, okay, let's, instead of a happy hour, let's have a Zoom happy hour. Um, great, but I don't know how many of you guys have done a lot of Zoom happy hours. They're not the same. And a big part of the problem is that at, at real social engagements, um, interactions are fluid. You know, I could get up and talk to the whole organization, you know, the whole group that's in front of me at a, at a physical happy hour. And as soon as I stop talking, two people over there might start talking to each other and two people over there might start talking to each other. And I'm not in that conversation. That doesn't happen at a Zoom happy hour. Or, and by the way, I use Zoom as just sort of like my, it's like calling it Kleenex. So it could be Teams, could be anything, could be Discord. But you don't have the easy breakout side conversations that allows you to start creating one-on-one -on -one social interactions. So how do we create that, um, that set of relationships that may have evolved organically in the new people that are coming aboard 
in a way, like how do we replace that? And the answer is, A, it's hard. Um, B, it's going to feel forced and weird in a lot of ways, right? And I, I, one of the things that I've started to do with, with our team is to start pushing for um, each of the people who is a key team member, and you're going to hear me talk a, lot, a bunch about this in a minute, um, each of those people, force them to have one-on-ones, force them to go sit for 30 minutes on a Zoom and just talk with no agenda. You know, um, okay, new person. Hi, I'm Mike. What do you want to talk about? What what questions do you have? What have you noticed? What have you learned? And that's where you can start forcing the same thing, but it feels forced. And it kind of is forced. The other thing as a leader that you can do is to really make social interaction, you know, make that an explicit part of the process. Tell everyone that's involved that they have to start socially interacting. Now, why? Um, the reason for me is that the social bonds of an organization, ultimately when that organization are under stress, is what allows you to succeed. You know, it's it's the built relationships that when all the systems have crashed and everyone wants to run around like chickens with their heads cut off, that keep you from strangling each other. And it's that stuff starts a, it starts during the interview process, but really it starts during your onboarding and as you start to become a member of the team. As you become embedded in that team, those social interactions create a web that allows you to, to handle stress as an organization. Well, if we don't do that in our, in our onboarding process, if our onboarding process goes from something that fosters social interaction to something that's just basically, here's how you set up benefits, here's how you set up your laptop, here's your GitHub account, buy, then we're not going to have the resilience as an organization to handle that later on. And so with that, moving on to later on, right? It's not just about when you bring people aboard to do those things. Those social interactions and those social networks are really the strength of an organization in the long term. And, you know, the those things often foster organically if you have a lunchroom, right? If, if I walk in and everybody's sitting at a table and having lunch, I just sit down next to them, uh, you know, as long as I'm feeling extroverted and feeling, you know, not, not asocial. And just the silly conversations that you have over pizza or over lunch or, or by, you know, doing a lunch and learn with everyone and, you know, ordering pizza or a team meeting or, or, or whatever, those are the things that carry you forward. Well, okay, now we can't do that. I actually, I had a long conversation with a friend the other day. I thought about having a, a, a pizza party for the whole team. Like, how do I, you know, effectively replicate what's on screen, right? I, I, I was thinking, let's do a lunch meeting and order everybody pizza. And I realized we're less than 10 people and the complexity of how do I order pizza to everyone's house was daunting. And so even the simple things that I could have done in an office start to become really difficult. And so I think one of the things that we have to really consider is the format of how we structure this. Because I said it earlier, and I think it's very true, with Zoom you know, video conference fatigue um, as a real thing, that becomes a finite resource. You know, It's not really a finite resource in most organizations to sit in a room with people. And so if I can sit in a room with everybody for, you know, 10, 12 hours and not be, uh, not be, you know, bleary eyed, that's one environment in which I can, I can load up on meetings. And if that meeting is, you know, is a waste of everyone's time, yeah, they're going to complain about it, but it doesn't impact the other meetings. Now, every meeting that I schedule that actually involves video conference interaction ultimately limits the the total number of those sorts of meetings that I can create. And so now we have to actually be ruthless within our organizations about the idea of, you know, this this meeting could have been an email or this meeting could have been a Slack conversation or this meeting could have been a shared Google Doc because meetings now become a finite resource. And meetings as a finite resource is something that most organizations, especially big ones, like when when I was at GE, um, people scheduled meetings to ask about what meeting they should schedule. 
And, you know, it's sort of a flip joke, like the whole Dilbert world is kind of kind of flip. But when every meeting you have exhausts you a little more than it used to, suddenly we can't just willy nilly have meetings all over the place. So we have to start being more ruthless about that. And especially because the only way that we can really build those social interactions is by having those meetings. You know, if the only way that I can create the social bonds amongst my team is to have Zoom stuff, I have to create space for them to do that. And so because of that, um, we have to be very intentional, A, about what we waste our Zoom time on, but also about ensuring that our people do that. Because, you know, when you're in an office environment, when you're in an actual, like, face-to-face uh, -face place, as I said, those those social bonds are important because they allow you to um, to overcome stressful situations. But also, those social bonds happen impromptu. They happen, you know, when you're walking by each other in the hallway, or when you sit down at a table to have lunch, or when someone says, "Hey, do you want to grab coffee?" These are things that happen naturally and organically when you're physically in proximity. If you're not physically in proximity, those things can't happen. Um, without you intentionally doing them. And now the interesting thing for me as a leader is that that's always been viewed as not work time, right? And and if I, especially if you went back 50 years, um, spending too much time, at, you know, going and getting coffee would be viewed as goofing off. Um, and and certainly when I had my first job, the the whole idea of if I just got on, you know, went and sat on a video conference and shot the breeze for an hour, with one of my with one of my teammates, very few of them would say that that was working. But realizing when we can't rely on the organic setup of social interaction, we have to intentionally schedule that. And as a leader, I actually even have to hold that uh, hold my teams accountable for that, right? So this this becomes a conversation that as a manager you need to start having with your teams. Think through. So you know, for one of my engineers. Who is the most important person for that engineer's success? Well, it's probably other engineers on the team. Maybe it's the product manager for their product. Maybe it's uh, somebody in product marketing. I, you know, I'm, I'm making some of these things up. Um, it, but if I sit down and I think, okay, who are all these people? Now, how do I encourage that engineer to create social time with each of those people? Right? And, and the best way to do it is simply to schedule one-on-ones. I, I think... I think one of the things in remote organizations is we need to have a lot more one-on-ones with people at peer levels than has ever been the case in the organizations that we have when everyone's sitting in an open open office plan within you know 10 yards of each other because those things aren't gonna happen naturally. Similarly, each of us has to think that way as well, right? Um, whether you know the CEO of the company all the way down to the most junior engineer should be thinking, okay, who are the people that that my relationship with will determine my success long term? And again, it's probably people on your team. It's probably your manager, which your manager should already be having weekly one on ones with you. I I ranted about that at B sides Las Vegas two years ago. Um, I, I'm not going to go into that rant, but you, you should be thinking about who are the people who with whom a relationship is important for me to succeed. And then you should be getting on their calendar with no agenda for those meetings, right? The, the agenda for that meeting should be to get to know each other. Because if you're not gonna be able to do that just by saying, hey, let's go get coffee. Um, for the next nine months to a year, the only way to create those social bonds is to actually force them to happen. And yes, I know it's forced. Um, and it's gonna feel forced. It feels weird to create a one-on-one -on -one with no agenda. Because um, you feel like you're wasting the other person's time and, you know, you feel like it's not an important meeting. I, I get all of the concerns about that and all of the weirdness, right? This is, this is the weirdest environment in which any of us have ever lived. And so these things probably will feel uncomfortable and strange. But um, to me, they're the only way to replicate the things that allowed us to be successful before. So... With that, and I, I intended this for 35 minutes, and I'm pretty much right on time, 
um, because I wanted to leave lots of room for questions and comments. And I knew I probably was saying some things that are going to make some people uncomfortable and probably a little counterintuitive at times. Um, I, I really want to just sort of summarize by saying, look, the the fatigue of this time and the isolation of this time are real and, and we're all experiencing it. Um, and that doesn't allow us, unfortunately, to just stop, right? I, you know, I started this startup nine months ago. I tell everyone it's the weirdest time in history to start a company, especially to start a company focused on healthcare security, because, you know, that's been an interesting environment. But it, whether I'm tired or not, whether we are forced to be isolated or not, I have to find a way to build a culture to make this company successful. And that means that we have to find a way around the the you know zoom fatigue it means we have to find a way for for people to have self care and most importantly it means we have to find a way for people who are coming into an organization without social bonds to those people to create the same kind of culture and same kind of social bonds that they would have had if they were sitting in an office at the same time and so it really requires that we are intentional across the three phases of the creation of that organization and culture and especially about how do we get you know how do we get the information that we wouldn't have had and and how do i convey the kind of information i would have conveyed when i don't have the same abilities um how do we replicate that you know the ability to create that sort of uh intentional work stream together and that's a whole other conversation and how do we create the social bonds that make us able to succeed as an organization in the long term um, when the stressful days happen? And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to questions. Um, uh, that's my info. Feel free to drop me an email. Feel, feel free to hit me up on Twitter or on LinkedIn anytime. I'm happy to chat about this or anything you know careers in general i've i've talked a lot about all a lot of things over the years so happy to do any of that but uh with that uh let's turn it over to questions and i have not been tracking discord as we've been, been <laughs> that's saying all right this. mike but we, we have for you <laughs> so good. Good. Um, good glad to hear it yeah as as uh, as mike just indicated if you do have any questions that you would like to ask during this presentation please use the active track free in the thick of it um, after this presentation, um, any questions could be uh, placed on the track three breakout. Mike, we have a couple of questions here for you. Um, this one comes from Barking Seal. How are you handling the changing of old habits, holding folks to account, such as making sure they understand and implement new tools and recognize change is necessary? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, uh, handling habit change is difficult. And I, I encourage everyone who wants to understand habit change and and the way that people learn to to look up BJ Fogg's work? Um, he did some incredible work on what he called the the Fogg behavior model many years ago. That um, that I think is probably the best description of how we change people's behavior that I've ever seen. And what it basically comes down to is changing people's behavior is hard, and so you have to do it slowly and over long periods of time, and especially when they're under cognitive load already. You know, uh, it, it, it's this time adds stress to everyone, and people don't learn and change very well when they're under stress. So I think the the answer is not easily. Um, you know, it's not easy to to affect change in good times. It's especially hard now, and so lots of patience lots of repetition and whatever you can do to eliminate the barriers to habit change if it if it's hard um, people won't do it and especially when they're already under stress if it's hard they don't have the the amount of motivation required to get them over the hump of difficulty when they're already under load is is really difficult. So, you know, if you know that someone that you're trying to get to change a behavior is going to be stressed about something, you have to make that behavior so easy to do that it becomes just the default choice. And um, unfortunately, that's usually not an easy thing. You know, if you've ever if you've ever tried to change, like, you know, somebody non-technical from a Mac to a PC or a PC to a Mac, 
you will understand what I'm saying. Like it, it takes time, it takes a lot of motivation, it takes a lot of repetition. You end up answering the same question over and over again, and you have to be patient because that's not an easy thing to do. And, and as a follow-up to that, uh, the uh, attendee has a, a follow-up indicating, uh, do you or will you make exceptions such as let those that are more challenged with the adoption, um, you know, the challenge regarding adoption or, or such as, you know, uh, changing more time. Um, I mean, it, the question is, are you prepared to go so far as this being a, a deal breaker, uh, letting them go once they've given the time to adopt but refuse to do so? Um, to I, I wish I, this is one of those times when this format is hard. I would have loved to ask for a little bit of clarification on what it is in that sentence. What, which behavior change are we talking about? It, if we're talking about, so for example, uh, we use Jira. If somebody's just having trouble figuring out Jira and um, and wants to go back and use some other bug tracking system, well, that's not going to work, right? They have to use the system that we all use, right? Or if if they're like, I hate Slack, let's go to Microsoft Teams. I'm going to use Microsoft Teams. The whole company can use Slack. I don't care. That's not going to work, right? And so I will be patient, and we will train, and we will work with them. But you know, you can't just be like, you guys are all on Slack. I'm on. I'm on Microsoft Teams. Like that's not how that works. Now, right. if if it's if it's something where it's like I'm, I I mean, my whole team and and me included is struggling with a lot of the things that I said in this in this presentation, right? It's it's hard to force yourself to do one on ones with someone and have nothing on your mind. That's a really uncomfortable thing, and I don't want to do it lots of days either. Um, and so, you know, I have to force myself to do some of these things. And so, yeah, I'm I'm incredible. Actually, I, I'm Canadian, and so I grew up patient, and I apologize for everything already. So, so I'm already super patient. But in this time, you have to be patient with everybody. I mean, everybody's so stressed out. And everybody's living through so many challenges and especially like if they're working with kids at home and I, i'm amazed none of you met my cat today usually my cat's right here and you all would have met uh him during this meeting like we're all living through this really weird time that's stressing everybody out and i think we all have to be super patient with each other uh, at work especially so and um so with, with the uh time that we have left for recording um i'm gonna pose you with one more question uh, th this also comes from the discord channel um, any advice for a remote leader who manages an on-premises team? Oh man, that's hard. Yeah, I've, I've, because, because the interesting thing about that is, it, you as the leader get left out of all the things I was talking about, right? You as the leader are left out of all of the social interactions, and that's such a tough place to be, because the culture forms, you know, sort of without you in it. If you think of the culture of an organization as a web that's that's uh, created largely by the social interactions between each person in that web, if you are far away, that web forms more strongly without you than than with than with you. Now that said, you get you already know that, right? You know that's the case. And so a lot of the things that I was talking about in here about how to be intentional about creating those those interactions and how to make sure that um, that you're creating those social connections to together, um, you have to be a lot more intentional about it. Like that, that's a person, and I don't know how big your organization is. Th this advice is only going to work up to an organization of about 20. Um, but it, you know, that's, that's where I'm going to be extra hardcore about making sure I have one-on-ones with every one of my directs every week and I never miss them. Right. I'm going to find ways to, I mean, if this was before COVID, suppose we're not in the world we're in, I would say, you know, expect to get on a plane at least once a month to go sit in that world, right? To go sit amongst that team. Um, I I lived that I, I lived that very strongly when I was at at Lookout, which was my last role before I started Scope. Um, I had a team in San Francisco, which is where I lived, and I had a team in Toronto. And for the first two years, I spent a week a month in Toronto. Now that that tailed off as I had you know built a lot of those social relationships and I could I, I could not do that as much. But in the early time, I had to spend that physical time with those people because that was how I was able to create the the social web that allowed me to be effective in the organization. Now, if it's now, 
Um, well, if it's now you, even the co-located team is probably remote. So you can start, you know, you, you're in the same boat, but if, you know, once we go back, I think it's harder, but you got to find a way to, to intentionally create those connections. Absolutely. Well, Mike, thank you very much for uh, providing your time and for giving back to the community here at Beastside San Antonio 2020. Uh, hate that we have to wrap up this way, but it has been an amazing day and uh, we could not have ended on a better note with your presentation. You hit uh, the nail on the head with your content. And while it is tough conversations for uh, organizations to have, they're real conversations. So thank you very much for your time.